Hello, my name is Gary Bedard. I'm an orthotist with Becker Orthopedic. The program I'm going to cover today is one in a series that addresses alignment factors in setting up a knee ankle foot orthosis for fabrication. It also updates the protocol that we use in determining what we have always called as toe out and what in the literature basically is called foot progression angle. So the name of this presentation is Getting It Straight, Knee Line pro of Progression, and Updated Alignment and Fabrication Protocol for Knee Ankle Foot Orthoses. Now this can be for, of course, static KAFOs, but more importantly, the dynamics that we have to take in consideration for setting up a stance control KAFO. The presentation goal is to improve the clinical and fabrication protocol in establishing the anatomical line of progression of the knee with the orthotic knee joint line of progression in a stance control orthosis. Our protocol progression, of course, is to measure our skeletal foot progression angle, use that determinant to set the alignment between our orthotic componentry and in modern fabrication, of course, doing that with a positive model. And then finally, having improved outcome dynamically with our patient in a stance control orthosis. In a stance control KFO, we have to be aware of the fact that our components now cycle on the rate that's equitable with prosthetics. And that's always considered to be one million cycles a year. From the standpoint of having a dynamic device, when we're trying to restore that element of community mobility for a patient, the literature basically tells us that the average distance to complete instrumental activities of daily living is 300 meters or 984 feet. So again, that orthotic knee joint is locking and unlocking for every step in that patient's hopefully renewed ability to be a community ambulator. We can compare that to the activity or cycle level of a drop lock KFO where that sit to stand exercise that a patient will cycle through in the course of their day. In a community setting, that's 71 times. In a day hospital, that's 57 times. In a ward, that's 36. That's, of course, much lower than what we would see in a fully compliant stance control patient because the joint's unlocking with every step rather than just how many times they're going through that sit to stand or stand to sit cycle. So the annual cycles, community, 24K, and award, I think that was supposed to be 12K. The protocol development, or I should say the protocol update, uh, came from my experiences of teaching a course at several universities within the MSPO programs uh, where we're not only looking at skeletal assessment, foot foot progression angle, but carrying those factors through through to fabrication exercises on the orthotic workstation, which I developed several decades ago. And these are the schools that are participatory in that long program um, that I offer the schools. It's based on fixture-based contouring fabrication, whereby we have the ability through the use of the orthotic workstation to lock our componentry in relationship to, your, to the positive model and then using a dual hand contouring procedure, we're able to quickly contour the uprights specifically to that individual limb and maintain our alignment of our component to our anatomical model throughout the process. And we'll show a demonstration of, of that exercise at the end of, of these components. 
terminology that we'll review at this point before we go into describing the update, both from a clinical measurement standpoint and then of course the actual alignment for fabrication is the long axis of the foot, the foot progression angle, knee line of progression, tibial torsion, hip joint antiversion and retroversion, and gait foot progression angle versus skeletal foot progression angle. In the literature, when we look at the long axis of the foot, there is multiple sightings for what is the appropriate anterior mark of that long axis. The literature is consistent in the posterior mark, which is a bifurcation of the width across the calcaneus. Even in our Atlas of Orthotics, it's listed as a line between the second and third toe. It appears that the significant literature citing uh, goes back to a German paper in 1987 where the distal mark is actually the center of the second toe. So since this has, appears to have the most literature significance for evidence-based medicine, that's the rule that I use at this point in time. Of course, you can put, pick your own rule as long as you're consistent in your measurement from the patient to your fabrication process. But then you also have to clarify it with your fabrication technician that he's using the same rule. So that's why at this point I put forth in terms of looking at the literature, it's the center of the second toe and bifurcation of the calcaneus defines the long axis of the foot. The foot progression angle is generally defined as the line between the line of progression or direction of gait. Uh, typically that should be the line of progression of the knee and a line representing the axis of the foot. You measure that differential and that's your foot progression angle. Now why is the foot progression angle important in determining the line of progression of the knee? Well, how do we translate the line of progression of the knee into the fabrication process? The technical barrier that we have to overcome is that a positive model is typically represented in a fully extended position. In modern fabrication, your technician might not be in the same facility as you are. He does not have the capability of articulating that positive model to then determine the line of progression of that patient's individual limb. So you have to define that alignment criteria for him so he accurately follows, sets up his technical fabrication alignment to match the actual skeletal alignment of the patient. Of course we all use visualization looking at the surface and skeletal landmarks of a positive model and then visualizing how that relates to our osseous components, uh, certainly in determining the establishes of our knee joint center, but in terms of establishing our line of progression of the knee, we can be much more accurate if we update our protocol to use foot progression angle. Historically, our clinometric tool was the NYU Lenice Orthotic Measurement Board. I think many of the schools still use this standard as part of their educational material for lower limb orthotics. But Lenice himself in his own paper about the Orthotic Measurement Board said, it does not measure the degree of toe out as related to the long axis of the foot. Rather, it measures the angular relationship between the medial border of the foot and the knee axis. The Lean Ice Board really was designed for conventional orthotic fabrication because it not only measured that medial border of the foot for a line of progression, it also measured the offset in tibial torsion. So that way there you could build that tibial torsion into the uprights of your conventional KFO. Um, that, in my opinion, was its strongest suit in terms of carrying forth those biomechanics. But, again in the literature, uh, Rosen said the medial border of the foot bears no constant relationship to the transverse axis of the ankle joint in such conditions as metatarsus adductus and clubfoot. 
this reference line may vary considerably. So, so you're adding a variant to your process that even in the literature is recognized as being a problem. From uh, that historical standpoint, that lean ice board is not compatible with what is our standard of practice at this point in time of fabricating total contact orthoses um, from a positive model. It was developed for a tracing type of fabrication technique. So even if you measured your patient with a lean ice board, your technician could not use the same device in order to set up the alignment of the positive model. So again, you're putting in an avenue of uh, variance um, and maybe decreasing the accuracy of carrying through your skeletal determinants to your custom device. External rotation of the foot from some of our literature, seven degrees or three and a half inch basis support. But if you look at some of the larger scans that were done as patients, this was a uh, patient done in Seattle with a, a thousand patient uh, series, where as you can see, it goes from, relates age and also the, the foot progression angle itself, how it changes through life. Uh, as you know, uh, we started in an internal rotation position in, in uh, fetal position or in, in um, utero, and then of course through weight bearing, that foot progression angle increases with age. Obesity now has an impact with pediatrics as well. So in terms of terminology review, the long axis of the foot is a line running from the mid calcaneus to the second toe. The per foot progression angle, and I tend to use that instead of toe out because ironically in the literature there's very little written about or using the term toe out. This, the, the bulk of the literature basically uses the term foot progression angle, so that's why I stay try to wean my way away from using toe out, even though that was a terminology that I was taught in school. And then of course, seven degrees can be the acceptable standard. Uh, in our own central fabs at Becker Orthopedic, if it's not indicated on the fabrication orthometry form, we use seven degrees as our standard unless the positive models look out of normal limits. And then of course, we'll make a call to the practitioner. And then we're looking at knee line of progression from a skeletal standpoint versus a gait standpoint. And again, you have, to, you have to evaluate the literature in terms of, the, of their actual protocols they're using to measure the knee line of progression with a patient and also foot progression angle, whether it's from a gait standpoint or whether it's from a skeletal standpoint. For our needs, we need a skeletal foot progression angle uh, primarily because we're building a device that, of course, is going to match that skeletal alignment and be congruent with it. The learning task we are going to go through is how we can combine the skeletal measurement with our fabrication process, uh, first determining the long axis of the foot, then from a skeletal standpoint, measuring the foot progression angle as it relates to the, as it relates to the line of progression of the knee, and then taking that measurement, and as I bring my cursor up on the screen, now that we've established the line of progression of the knee on our positive model by measuring, accurately measuring the skeletal foot progression on, angle on the patient, then the line of progression of the knee of our positive model is going to match the line of progression of our component tree as we go through the alignment setup of our component tree. That's how we become consistent in carrying through our clinical evaluation of the patient through our clinical or fabrication alignment uh, in preparation for fabrication. So again, protocol progression, you're measuring the skeletal foot progression angle of our patient as it relates to the line of progression of the anatomical knee, setting that into our fabrication process, and of course then building that into our device. It's imperative in orthotic fabrication because one of the main differences between orthotic and prosthetic fabrication is that in prosthetics you have modular componentry and you can undertake dynamic gait adjustment with your components to optimize your patient's gait. Unfortunately, that same modular adjustment does not exist on the orthotic side primarily because of the weight penalty it would entail in building those 
that adjustment into the orthotic components. And because in prosthetics, we've got a certain mass that we can fill through, through the execution of the prosthesis. In orthotics, we're adding weight to that patient's limb through that wearable orthosis. So we have to keep everything as light as possible. That's a critical factor because we're all dealing with a neuromuscular deficit on the orthotic side. In terms of clinical measurement techniques, there are several techniques that are represented in the literature. You have the thigh foot angle, you have the thigh transmolalar angle, and also you have tibial torsion that's being done in a seated position. Uh, we're all driven in some regards in what we do as attending orthotists, especially in a pediatric situation by certain treatment uh, uh, logarithms. In this treatment flow chart, you can see that they're looking at uh, in-towing in a patient, and with that in-towing, it's a screening examination to rule out hip dysplasia, cerebral palsy, et cetera, et cetera. Once they establish a rotational profile of that limb, then they follow the a logarithm down in terms of our treatment. I'm sure many of you have dealt with UCBLs for children, uh, twister cables, Helfit heel seats, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of looking at rotational uh, developmental issues with children. So we're all basically uh, participatory in that treatment flow chart as orthotists. In terms of skeletal and clinical protocols, um, the benchmark paper for looking at tibial torsion was done by a French orthopedist by the name of Le Demane. Uh, his English paper was published in 1909. Uh, the French version came out in 1903. And that is truly the benchmark paper when it comes to looking at tibial torsion in patients. Now the three clinical techniques are, are accomplished in a sitting, a supine, or a prone position. So um, in looking at the techniques that are offered in the literature, literature-based outcome, um, uh, you can use any one of these techniques in order to fit the situation, the best situation to measure your patient, whether you put your patient in a sitting position, supine, or prone. Um, as long as you're executing it with the understanding of the underlying biomechanics, you're going to have the same end result. So from the Seattle Children's Hospital, they used a sitting position. Uh, it was not unlike the, the lean ice board in terms of measuring the apices of the malalai away from a backer board with a ruler. Um, why they didn't use the uh, lean ice device, I'm not quite sure because certainly the Lean Ice Board would, could accommodate a pediatric patient, and they did adult patients for their 1,000 patient scan, but techniques are very similar. Um, one of my popular techniques is the thigh foot angle in a prone position. This is one of the exercises that I use in the labs in the school for a practicum. With the patient prone, the knee flexed to 90 degrees, you can sight down the long axis of the foot. Uh, with one end of the protractor, sight down the thigh with the other end of the protractor, and that will give you your, um, your um, basically foot progression angle as it relates to the line of progression of the patient's knee. Uh, transmolalar axis, thigh transmolalar, I think has a, probably a higher degree of accuracy uh, because you're eliminating anything that could be happening in the patient's forefoot. But from a visual standpoint, I find it's harder to mark this on the patient and sight down the foot as you're measuring, of course, with the transmolalar axis. And then uh, it becomes a little bit tricky in terms of how you hold your protractor on top of the patient as well. So it's, it, I don't find it really as, as accommodating to your clinical needs as the previous exercise. In terms of clinic metric tools, um, testing methods, of course, you can use uh, a normal protractor that's well represented in the literature in terms of uh, accuracy, uh, examiner, examiner, et cetera, et cetera. So it's one of our standard tools. Um, one of the upgraded goniometers that, are, that is now on the market, this is one from Baseline. This is a goniometer built in with a bubble level. Uh, I particularly like this one basically because having a bubble level, it gives you an accurate uh, arm on the goniometer that is set to gravity, of course, with the bubble level rather than just trying to eyeball it completely. In terms of, of a device that I came up with before I even found the bubble level, uh, was uh, something that I made in prototype and one of our engineers made a series of six. I call it the two-toe goniometer. 
uh, kind of an amalgamation of using the second toe for that toe out estimation. Uh, it was back when I was still using toe out as a term rather than foot progression angle. Uh, using my cursor, you can see it looks like a generic UCBL. It has rubber bumpers to center of the calcaneus in relationship to the pivot point of your measurement arm for the goniometer. It has a slot so you can actually use it in double pencil to mark it on the patient. It has an elastomeric component called a rubber band that you can wrap around the second toe to keep some tension and, and assist with alignment on the foot. And then as you have this on the patient, you level out the bubble, and of course it gives you your foot progression angle. Um, and then those are all the elements that I just mentioned, um, basically in their function. So um, we haven't decided to make it at Becker yet, but I do use it at the schools as we had a series of six to go along with, we're at the schools where I run this exercise. In the literature, um, there is, there is uh, uh, a good representation of torsionometers. Uh, these are devices that, that investors, investigators have used in order to measure tibial torsion in patients for their series profiles. Um, I had never seen any of these except by pictures in the literature, so I've never seen these offered in the orthotics field for clinical use. Um, we'll go through a, a couple of the clinical measurement techniques at this point, visually. Uh, in a supine position, um, you can basically have the patient with their hip at 90 degrees, their knee at 90 degrees, sight down the femur, put the foot in a neutral position. You can use a two-toe in this procedure and sight down the foot. You can have some students at ASU uh, basically going through the practicum in a, in a lab. Um, and of course, again, having the elastomeric component on the second toe, um, the goniometer itself with the long axis is following the long axis of the foot. And then, of course, once you put the bubble level in its, in, in its corresponding horizontal position indicated by the level, then you are given a degree reading uh, with the knee at 90 degrees, the thigh vertical representing the line of progression of the knee. So this is a very easy technique to follow, uh, either with the two-toe or with the bubble goniometer, as we're seeing here. Uh, in this case, with one of the students at the University of Pittsburgh, um, this person was obviously a transtibial amputee, and we, for a curiosity, asked this uh, student to allow us to measure their foot progression angle as it related to the line of progression of their knee, just to see how their prosthetist had set up the prosthetic foot. Um, we had a very good discussion in regards to would it be appropriate to match the foot progression angle of the prosthetic foot with the sound side? This was a unilateral uh, amputee. Um, so we, it was, it was, the consensus was, was undetermined at that point in time, primarily because many prosthetists rely on observational dynamic gait alignment for comfort of the patient rather than matching the actual foot progression angle from the prosthetic side to the anatomic side. Uh, my retort was that if a prosthetic foot is designed to give you the same ground reaction forces as a normal foot, then it should have the same foot progression angle. So that was my challenge thought to the students on that particular day. The prone clinical method uh, is also a technique that I, I've utilized. It seems it works very well in a pediatric setting because children are used to being on their abdomen face down. Again, with the knee flexed to 90 degrees, you measure along the long axis of the foot, uh, then correspondingly in line with the femur to give you your foot progression uh, angle. Here again at ASU, we're conducting the measurement and you can see the long arm of the goniometer, mid calcaneus, mid second ray, and then of course, following the femur at that point in time gives you your foot progression angle. Um, Another reading, this was done at Pittsburgh, showing a long view, again, through the second ray, mid calcaneus, long, uh, following the, the axis, linear axis of the femur. In a sitting clinical measurement, this is appropriate at times as well, can be used both with the, uh, the two-toe and with the bubble goniometer. Here, this is a little bit more dynamic, but in some cases, it's, it's, it provides a higher level of comfort for the patient who do not want to be prone or supine. Uh, with the patient, much like the lean eyes technique where you keep the thigh 
perpendicular to the edge of your exam table, run the knee through its range of motion to full extension, make sure you're not internally or externally rotating the femur at this point in time, bring the limb to full extension, and at that point, capture your measurement of your foot progression angle. So in essence, we've got three techniques that we can use for patients, all with the same underlying biomechanics that we're looking at the long axis of the foot in relationship to the line of progression of the knee. That is the key point, the long axis of the foot in relationship to the line of progression of the knee. What our technician cannot see is the line of progression of the knee. So in essence, we're using the foot progression angle as it relates to the line of progression of the knee from a skeletal standpoint to give our technician that determinant so when they set up their positive model then you have a higher degree of predictability that your orthotic knee joints are going to have the same line of progression as your anatomic uh, uh, as your anatomic line of progression that's our key so now that we've measured and shown the techniques of measuring foot progression angle we want to translate that foot progression angle to our positive model. So as we went, mentioned earlier, that learning task, right? We've determined the line of progression of our knee. We, from that skeletal determinant, we then have established our foot progression angle as it relates to the long axis of the foot, and then we translate it to our orthotic workstation for fabrication. Um, and this just defines what I just said. Long axis of the foot determines bottom model knee line of progression. And there's just some visualizations of measuring with the two-toe on your patient and then translating that to the orthotic workstation. That orthotic workstation happens to be at the University of uh, uh, Malaya in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. So um, I've been involved with educational programs in, in that setting in the Far East. Uh, and then this one was one in Mexico where you can see we're using the bubble level to establish our foot progression angle and measuring it on our positive model. Um, and again, um, close up of that bubble level. Uh, basically, I like using a bubble level because it definitely gives you a positive reference in terms of your vertical line. Um, this all started with uh, this update to the protocol. I actually started at um, Georgia Tech several years ago with a graduate student there who's now a, a CPO in the Atlanta area, Jennifer Reese. And as we were going through our exercise of uh, fabricating KFOs, uh, I asked Jennifer and her partner how they were going to set up uh, her the toe out, because that was the term I was using then instead of foot progression angle, because that's how I was educated. Uh, how much toe out they were going to use in terms of setting the line of progression of the knee for their anatomical model. And Jennifer said that they were going to use 28 degrees. And I asked how they measured it, and they said they measured it walking. Uh, so they did not distinguish between skeletal toe-out and gait toe-out. So we went through the exercise of, of uh, looking at that differential at that point in time. And then when Jennifer became a resident, she actually ran a 20-patient series through an exercise that we collaborated with, and she presented this at AOPA a couple of years ago. And so I don't have time to go through her whole paper. Uh, it was a, it's an unpublished paper. Uh, but she went through the different methodologies in terms of using a goniometer, using a lean ice board, using the two-toe, and then, of course, uh, the goniometer in, in a supine position, and she found the two-toe is the most accurate. Um, that was in her 20 exercise. Um, I think they all can be accurate when you understand the biomechanics of what you're trying to accomplish. I think prone and sitting and supine all can be equally um, accurate as long as you're executing your protocol uh, with a sound understanding of the underlying biomechanics. So at this point, to progress a little bit more, we're going to look at tibial torsion. We're going to look at rotation and torsion. We're going to look at the screw home mechanism. We're going to look at hip joint antiversion and retroversion and gait foot progression angle versus skeletal foot progression angle. So this is, you know, it developed to be into a progressive type of learning task as we go through uh, terminology or techniques uh, that you might not be uh, familiar with at this point in time. So in looking at gait foot progression angle versus skeletal foot progression angle, as you know, uh, in the gait side, it can be derived from the hip in terms of a patient externally rotating their foot to shorten their toe lever arm to make it easier to step over 
that foot rather than having a low toe, toe lever arm. So we see that in, you know, in an abnormal or deviant gait, basically. Where from a skeletal standpoint, if we look at it in the transverse plane, we know that there's an offset in all your axial, uh, all, your, all the axes at both your hip, your knee, and your transmalleolar axis. So we have to take that all into account as we determine what's the best technique for our patient. And of course, it's skeletal uh, foot progression angle, not gait. Uh, so because gait toe out can be a compensatory mechanism. It could be from soft tissue restriction. It could be a volitional compensation mechanism. Uh, it can be a skeletal restriction. Where skeletal toe out is a relation, the actual relationship of the foot and ankle as we do our exam. Uh, and of course that could be impacted by a surgical outcome as well. Um, here's a patient, two different side-by-side -side screens. Uh, in one, he's walking without an orthosis. In the other, he is walking with a stance control KFO. Um, this is a good example of pathohabituation. And what I mean by that is this was a, a, a gentleman in his uh, late 40s who uh, elected not to wear a drop lock KFO, would stabilize his knee because he had a little bit of a hip flexor. He had relatively hardly any hip extensor, pretty much no quad, nothing, and nothing before the foot and ankle uh, from an uh, MMT standpoint. And by externally rotating his foot in the left-hand screen, you can see his compensation method of using his MCL in order to stabilize his knee. If he brought his foot within a normal line of progression, we would find that uh, his knee would probably buckle and fall. So this was a, his compensation strategy. So the orthotist did fit him with a stance control KFO. Uh, unfortunately, this demonstrates that the patient uh, how strong their pathohabituation is. Just because we put them in a stance control KEFO, does that mean they're going to improve their line of progression? Uh, in fact, this, this patient was so set in that pathomechanical compensation that the practitioner act actually had to use a TES belt in order to give him the proprioception to improve his line of progression. Um, in, in doing the actual foot progression angle measurement on this patient, this pre patient presented with a normal seven degrees of foot progression angle or toe out as we've called it in the past. So normal skeletal alignment, but this was purely gait, uh, a gait foot progression angle in terms of being an excessive amount of, of toe out, right? So just keep that in mind. In terms of uh, pelvic and limb control, we have improved that component in patient in terms of line of progression and improving their gait toe out, gait foot progression angle by incorporating um, thigh cuffs on KFOs that have some pelvic and soft tissue enhancement, uh, both using step through socket type of technology or cuff using initial seat and in the, probably the most advanced one, uh, personally working with Marlon Ortiz down in Guadalajara, using his MOS socket technology in the thigh cuff of a KEFO. Um, so there is technology we can use to improve our, our uh, gait dynamics, um, uh, but I can't say this is universal at this point in time. Uh, in terms of that skeletal toe out, uh, it's all dependent, or toe in, it's all dependent on antiversion, retroversion, of course, Antiversion will create in-towing because of the femoral neck angle. Uh, retroversion will create out-towing. So in Jennifer Reese's case, with her 828 degrees of external uh, rotation of the foot, uh, 28 degrees foot progression angle, it was because of her, uh, her femoral neck angle, she had retroversion. Uh, so she was basically towed out during gait. Uh, when we measured her skeletal foot progression angle, it, again, it was seven degrees. So you can just can imagine a scenario we would have one, ended up in in that KFO ex, uh, fabrication exercise with the students if we had set the toe out or the foot progression angle at 28 degrees. We would have some significant uh, anatomical binding between the limb and the orthosis just because we weren't matching the skeletal dynamics uh, for Jennifer. Studies on tibial torsion, as I said, Le Demane was one of the first to describe tibial torsion. 
Uh, in his paper, he said that there, he discovered that there was four degrees of medial rotation in the newborn with 20 degrees of lateral rotation in the adult with a range of zero to 40 in adults. Of course, what he means by medial rotation would be internal rotation. They represent it as a negative number, and where a positive number represents um, toe out or foot progression, a positive uh, foot progression angle. Uh, tibial torsion, by definition, in the Manning's paper, means a twist within the tibia. And he also established the axes of measurement, both at the tibial plateau and, of course, the transmalalar axis. Uh, his research was all based on cadaveric specimens. Um, this was not from a live situation. Of course, from a radiologic standpoint, there was no x-rays at that point in time, so they had to work with cadaveric specimens, and that was his version of a tropometer, how to measure tibial torsion on a patient from the actual skeletal component itself. Um, as the x-ray technology, this is from the 50s, became available, that's a really scary x-ray looking machine, but nonetheless, they did start with that technology in the 50s in terms of, the, of, of having a more precise method of measuring tibial torsion. Uh, the most accurate methodology, of course, is using uh, CT type of scans where they can go in and actually do a slice image of that component or where they want to uh, highlight their measurement point. So this is probably the most accurate method, and there's papers right up to this date in terms of using this technology. Um, the clinical assumption that we found, though, in doing the literature research is that the assumption that the line of progression of the knee is represented by the alignment of the femur in the tibia when the patient has the limb flexed to 90 degrees. Up here I have it when the patient is seated, but as you saw, we've had the patient in a prone position, a supine position, or in a seated position. The key point is that knee flexed to 90 degrees. Does that represent the line of progression of the knee? And then, ironically, it really wasn't discussed in the literature. But what was discussed in the literature was the aspects or the effects of rotation and torsion on the lower limb, where rotation may be defined as a turning of one unit about another. So in clinical biomechanics, we can consider the unlocking of the screw hole mechanism and the resulting rotation in the transverse plane that occurs between the femur and the tibia that happens at that point in time that's due to rotation. Torsion may be defined as a twisting in the axis of a same unit. So that's a different way of describing tibial torsion. Of course, that's also represented in the hip joint from our femoral neck angle. But when we think about the implications of measuring tibial torsion in respect to the line of progression of the knee, and then measuring um, retroversion, antiversion at the hip, it's not as critical in orthotics. Uh, primarily because different types of anatomical joints. Uh, the hip joint is a ball and socket joint. So that means even if we set up a HKAFO, we just set them in basically perpendicular to the pelvis to represent the line of progression of the hip. Um, and we can get away with that because it's a ball and socket joint. Where in the knee, we have to be very accurate because the knee and the foot and ankle have very defined lines of progression. So that's why we've got to be much more accurate in terms of measuring our foot progression angle as it relates to the line of progression of the knee and we can discount the line of progression of the hip basically or what represents the patient as antiversion or retroversion because we've got this ball and socket joint and it doesn't have a defined line of progression. So um, that's not well defined in our literature, but the underlying bio that's kind of the under in a nutshell, very simplified, is the underlying biomechanics. So torsion is an osseous, osseous component, so as, such as tibial torsion or femoral neck angle for retroversion and antiversion. Rotation is purely joint mechanics, and in the lower extremity, we have to be very aware of the screw home mechanism and what represents to what we're trying to accomplish with our patients. So to review that element a little bit, uh, we have to look at functional knee arthrokinematics. Uh, the screw hole mechanism in terms of what it means, what happens in the transverse plane, and how that axial motion actually occurs. Now we do know that we have an eight degree change in rotation in the transverse plane as we, un as we unlock the screw hole mechanism. And, re and, and equal with that, or simultaneous to that unlocking of the screw hole mechanism, 
we have an eight degree change in the angulation between the femur and the tibia, which is sometimes called the Q angle. So as we have full extension at the knee, typically we have seven to 11 degrees of valgus represented in that alignment. Seven degrees for a male, 11 degrees for a female on average, primarily because females have a wider pelvis than males. So consequently they have a higher genuvalgum representation within normal limits. As a patient goes into pre-swing and you attain 25 degrees of knee flexion, the unlocking of the screw home mechanism creates a various movement within the knee so that there the femur and the tibia become aligned with each other. Now let me show you why that happens. The lateral condyle of the femur is about a third smaller than the medial condyle. And corresponding to that, the lateral tibial plateau is much smaller than the medial tibial plateau. So as the femur, as the knee unlocks from the screw hole mechanism where you have maximum congruency of your articular surfaces, the medial side moves forward basically because it has more surface area to cover. So it's not unlike having a big wheel and a small wheel on the same solid axle. And as we know, just taking these wooden wheels and a wooden axle uh, from uh, a, an art supply store, I ran this video just to show that arc segment of movement with the big wheel and a little wheel. So in essence, the way this represents our knee, it's as if we were looking from back to front at a medial, or I should say a right leg with the big wheel being the medial condyle the right wheel being the lateral condyle, so we have external rotation of the femur on tibial, the top of the tibial plateau. Of course, there's open chain and closed kinetic chain uh, considerations there, but in essence, you have this rotation that occurs where the femur could be externally rotating on the tibia, or the tibia could be internally rotating underneath the femur, depending if we're looking at this from an open or closed kinetic chain. So just be aware of that as you read the literature as they describe the tibia, the unlocking of the screw hole mechanism. Are they describing it from an open kinetic chain or a closed kinetic chain? But it still comes down to the fact we have a big wheel and a little wheel. Um, to give you one more point of illustration, this comes from uh, Dr. Lee, uh, Lee uh, um, uh, Child's down at uh, Alabama State University while he was doing his PhD work at Georgia Tech. Um, it was in prosthetics, but nonetheless, um, I thought this video that it was part of his research with a person sitting on a stationary bicycle uh, exemplified that very smooth of the knee. So if we look at the right leg on this, uh, this uh, graphic, you can see that as they come to full extension at the bottom of the cycle stroke, the knee is in its maximum valgus, genuine valgus position. But as they come to the top of the pedal stroke, you can see that various movement of the knee. You can see this in the real world behind somebody on a normal bicycle or on a stationary bike, upright bike at a gym, because the pelvis is restricted from its sinusoidal motion from side to side. So it accentuates that visualization of that various movement of the knee as you stand behind the person on the bike or trail somebody on a bicycle, you can see that various movement. So it's just an interesting uh, component or phenomenon of our bipedal locomotion, whereas we initiate swing through, we have this various movement of the knee, which helps to create or increase the bypass clearance between our knees. So nice little phenomenon of, of bipedal gait. Uh, and as I said, get behind somebody on an upright bicycle and it becomes uh, very apparent because of the stabilization of the, of the pelvis in the line of progression of the body. But there was no discussion in the literature regarding the rotational aspects of the unlocking of the screw hole mechanism of all the series that have been done in terms of uh, looking at tibial torsion. So uh, that was just an interesting, I thought was an interesting deficit in the uh, literature. Uh, could, be, could we call this a clinical science deficit? 
Well, it's, if, you, if you want an interesting book to read sometime, How Doctors Think, it's a layperson's look at, oh, the, it's a layperson's description of the cognitive science of how doctors actually come to their diagnostic decisions. So uh, be, all of us being patients ourselves at some point in time, it's a very interesting read. But the assumptive knowledge is that when we flex the knee to 90 degrees, we have always assumed that represented the line of progression of the knee. Now that we've examined the actual uh, unlocking of the screw hole mechanism and how it impacts us as orthotists as we design an appropriate and accurate biomechanical orthosis for that patient is certainly a consideration that we have to take in, into uh, uh, consideration. So uh, to end this segment, uh, we've got two more to go through. Uh, one, we'll be looking at establishing knee joint center, and then finally we'll run, go through the orthotic workstation, and then at the end we'll show and a uh, demonstration of how to set up a positive model in a, the orthotic workstation. So in this segment, we went through and looked at the long axis of the foot and defined it. We defined foot progression angle as it respect to the literature, middle calcaneus. Uh, I should say long axis of the foot was middle calcaneus and second ray. Foot progression angle as being the skeletal determinant between the, the actual line of progression of the patient's knee and the foot progression angle. Uh, knee line of progression, tibial torsion, rotation versus torsion, screw hole mechanism, hip joint antiversion, re retroversion, and gait foot progression angle and skeletal foot progression angle. So I hope this segment was, was worthwhile. Uh, hope that the upgrade in the protocols of measuring the patient uh, help folks to standardize what they're going to do, at least from a biomechanical standpoint. Uh, you do have the option of the three measurement techniques, prone, sitting, and supine. So uh, as you take on the task of creating more accurate stance control KFOs, I think you do have to take these skeletal considerations and protocols into play. Thank you very much. Ready? Yep. Hello, thank you very much. My name is Gary Bedard. I'm an orthodist from Becker Orthopedic. Uh, this is our second in a series of presentations that are, have been organized to help us in the fabrication of a knee ankle foot orthosis, looking at our skeletal assessment, which was the first part. Um, now we're going to look at determinants of anatomic and fabrication knee joint centers. In my involvement with the schools, I've come to understand that the university standard in that clinical determination of the instant center of rotation of the knee is a clinical technique whereby you palpate the adductor tubercle, palpate the medial tibial plateau, split that difference, take a measurement from that point to the floor, and that helps us to establish our mechanical instant center of rotation, and of course, help us to align it with our positive model. Here's a typical clinical scenario. Patient in a seated position, knee to 90 degrees, tape measure from the floor with a sock foot, up to the medial tibial plateau. Palpate the adductor tubercle, and that'll give you your ability to uh, come up with your knee height. The problem with the university standard, even though it's served us well, and it's still a determinant that you should measure on your patient, is that the bony prominences in those areas are somewhat undistinguished targets. There is no specific point that allows us to have a higher degree of predictability of where the instant center of rotation of the knee is actually located. So the clinical goal of this guide, which I established way back in uh, early in my career while I was fabricating knee braces, 
is to increase the precision of targeting the anatomical center of rotation from like static examination with anticipation of the dynamic change in the instant center due to the three-dimensional aspects of knee arthrokinematics, right? uh, primarily taking into consideration the unlocking of the screw hole mechanism. So the upgrade to the university standard is to improve our target definition to hopefully having a single point target that's based on the eccentric origin of the ACL. Now, that comes from functional arthrokinematics, comes from understanding in, in basic form our ligament function from an origin and insertion standpoint and also mechanics of the individual ligaments, and then looking at the screw hole mechanism in the transverse plane and axial rotation. Now, Losi called the ACL the guiding ligament of the knee, primarily because in stance phase, it is the primary ligament that establishes the relationship of the femur on top of the tibial plateau. So as we go into knee flexion, we come off that broad radius that's represented on the distal aspect of the femur where we have maximum congruency between the articular surfaces of our femur and our tibia. And as the knee goes into its flex position, it's almost as if it has a second radius that represents the active zone of kinematics of the knee, a motion of the knee. So as that knee moves forward and we have the combination of rolling and gliding. The isometric origin of the ACL unfortunately for us is inaccessible because it's in the intratrochlear notch. We can't palpate its origin to give us that idea of where the instant center of the, the knee um, is located. But luckily in the literature, that isometric origin is exceedingly well defined. Because if you have an orthopedic surgeon who is attempting an ACL reconstruction, his bone plug positioning for that reconstruction has to be very accurate because it's, if he's on either side of that zone, he'll end up with an ACL that's either loose or too tight. So uh, it's been very well defined in the literature like, exactly where it occurs. Here's just another representation from another paper of how well they blueprinted, in essence, where the ACL uh, origin is located. Uh, but if we take that origin and relate it to external uh, skeletal and soft tissue landmarks, then we have the ability to pick a target that's much more accurate. And that target is the origin of the, of the lateral collateral ligament. And this is a much more accurate location than anything we find on the medial side of the knee, uh, primarily because of the shape of the LCL. It's a very rope-like uh, uh, configuration or shape to this ligament. So consequently, its origin is concentrated rather than being spread out in a broad, broad band, as we'll see with the MCL. So that means on the um, lateral side of the condyle, we have this small bony protuberance that can be palpated that give us, us a higher degree of predictability of where the instant center of rotation of the knee is. And of course, if we're making a stance control KFO that basically unlocks with every step and the knee is articulating with every step, it is important for us to have a higher degree of accuracy if we're going to match orthotic knee joint centers to that anatomical center. Uh, the problem though from a clinical palpation standpoint is that the iliotibial band in full extension uh, covers the origin of the lateral collateral ligament. So the clinical technique is we have to flex the knee to about 8 to 10 degrees of flexion. What that does for us biomechanically is it reflects the ITB posteriorly it allows the, in essence, the lateral side of the femur to expose itself out from underneath that tendon sheet, and it exposes the origin of the lateral collateral ligament. Now, this does take a little bit of physical practice and examination, of course, of a skeletal model. 
so that you know what that little protuberance looks like because it's not huge, but it is. it can be palpated. And you can learn this technique by flexing the knee, as I said, from zero to about 10 degrees at maximum. Once you get past that point, I find it's very difficult to palpate that little protuberance. It just gets lost in the soft tissue. But with the knee flexed to about 10 degrees, you can actually feel it gliding underneath the tendon sheath of the ITB and then of course exposing itself along the anterior border or margin of the ITB as you flex its knee. So there is a little clinical technique to this um, uh, protocol. Uh, here, just as a representative value, the medial condyle is very broad and flat where the lateral condyle does have that little protuberance that you can palpate where the origin of the lateral collateral ligament is located. Why can't we do this on the medial side? Well, it comes down to, again, that cross-sectional shape of the medial collateral ligament. Uh, it is very band-like in terms of its cross-section, um, primarily because as the femur moves forward uh, from the unlocking of the screw hole mechanism, which we discussed in the last segment, as that medial condyle moves forward, there's different striations of the fibers that become taut that offer that ligament stability. Uh, so consequently, it's very band-like in nature, where the lateral collateral ligament is very cord-like in nature. And because it's very band-like in nature, that means its origin is very flat and somewhat undistinguishable compared to the very sharp little protuberance that we have for the, for the LCL. And here we have them both side by side. Uh, this looks a little bit in terms of the function of the joints or their action as the knee unlocks. Since the lateral collateral is a smaller radius and it has a smaller tibial plateau and the, the ligament itself is shorter, that lateral collateral ligament pretty much stays in place as the knee unlocks. It's the, M, the medial condyle is giving that anterior movement and with the long movement of the MCL, uh, that allows us to have the unlocking of the screw hole mechanism. So we have to look at function, shape of your condylar surfaces, length of your condylar surfaces, diameter of your condyles on the femur, all attribute to that unlocking of the screw hole mechanism. And of course, as we mentioned last time, the reduction of valgus of the knee because of the varus movement. Um, have it right here again. Uh, I forgot I was going to repeat it. Uh, eight degrees of rotation, transverse plane, eight degrees of movement in the coronal plane in the alignment between the fem femur and the tibia. And of course, as we explained in the last component, the lateral collateral is about a third smaller than the medial side. So as we look at the tibial plateau, the lateral uh, tibial uh, plateau is smaller from an anterior posterior standpoint compared to the medial side, which is much longer. Um, so when we're setting that anterior posterior placement of the knee, we've got to take into consideration how it falls into the condyle itself. Uh, the general rule, uh, besides finding our knee joint height, we have to find our AP depth. And the literature uh, has been very standard to say that it's a 60-40 ratio of where we place that instant center of rotation. So in our progression of establishing our knee center of the patient, we first measure from the, from the ground, medial tibial plateau adductor tubercle, split that difference, and then put it the 60-40 rule in the place, or we basically find the lateral collateral ligament. Um, typically, I use a combination program. I'm doing both. I'm not only using the medial side to find my medial tibial plateau, my adductor tubercle, splitting that difference, measuring from the floor, and then using my 60-40 rule, I go to the lateral side and find that very accurate point, and I correlate the both of them when I'm setting my orthotic knee joints up the place. So, so I don't discount the rules that exist in place. I just use the added rule to give us another visualization of that instant center of rotation of the knee. And as we do the practicum at the end, you'll see how I use both rules at that point in time. Um, there's a very nice tool from uh, Autobach. It's a, it's a ratioed goniometer. Um, it basically is um, a scissoring type of apparatus that can fit over the patient's knee and then fit over your positive model is typically where we do use it. Uh, it's a fairly inexpensive. I think it's a brilliant de de device. Uh, I took the long pointer. As you can see in this video, 
there is a long pointer that typically represents the line of progression of the patient's knee. Uh, I, I, I always think I'm gonna poke my eye out with that thing. So instead, I've, uh, since I do like bubble levels, I've just attached a uh, carpenter's line level to the um, uh, crossbar connecting the two elements of that goniometer, that ratio goniometer. So when I put it on the foot, or I should say put it on the um, patient's positive model, uh, then you can shrink it down through the action of the scissoring goniometer, and, and it's a ratioed goniometer where it's always 60-40, and then it has a hollow rivet. So if you sit this on the limb, level out your bubble, mark your indelible pencil, then you've got 60-40 determination on both sides of the limb. Now, prior to this, you've already set your foot progression angle as it relates to the line of progression of the knee. So this is your secondary step, which we'll cover when we do the practicum. Um, here, we're doing it at one of the schools. You can see it, it will, its ML can be adjusted to the width of the, of the positive model. They're holding the bubble level so that it's, ac that it's in its level position and now taking a pencil and going through the hollow rivet to mark that 60-40 location on your positive model. So you have a very accurate goniometer that instead of trying to visualize that 60-40 bias, you're actually measuring it with the goniometer. And then at that point in time, since you've measured your knee height, your knee depth, you now can use the surrogate pointer on the orthotic workstation to start the alignment of your componentry and your uh, fabrication alignment. So we're carrying through our rules here and our techniques to establish that very accurate alignment for fabrication. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous segment, um, many times in the past we've done this through visualization of uh, understanding the biomechanics of the knee and predicting where that instant center rotation is going to be look at, look, uh, uh, set. Now we're able to set it in a, in a defined methodology using the fixture of the orthotic workstation to lock our orthotic component tree in alignment with our osseous component. So again, in the goal of, of updating our precision. Now, to give you some impact of how critical this can be, uh, this is a paper I gave many, many years ago, 1991, at the Ortho Rehar meeting at the World Congress in Berlin. And the paper was, How Effective Are Multicentric Joints for the Knee? Uh, my point here is not to look at the effectiveness of a multicentric knee, but because they have a particular type of orthokinematics, misalignment of the orthotic instant center rotation compared to anatomic instant center rotation is is enhanced uh, by a misalignment. Um, so this was a method whereby we wanted to visualize uh, the evaluation of orthotic knee joints with kinematic compliance through fixation of the orthotic knee joints to osseous models. Um, the theory being that if an orthotic knee joint has correct orthokinematics, that when you attach them to bone models, the bone models should be in the same anatomical position as your anatomical knee as you put it through a range of motion. Um, so back then when I was uh, doing a lot of ACL work, we were looking at knees with insufficient ligamentous support and that the orthotic knee joints were provided, providing that orthokinematic guidance. So it was looking at the effect, the, um, efficacy of orthotic knee joint design uh, being demonstrated by that spatial relationship of the fixed osseous components. So we compared the orthotic joints that were fixated to bone models with MRI images of, of the relationship between the femoral condyle and the tibial plateau. So as we flexed the orthotic model with the bones mounted to the orthotic joints, they should be in the same position at the same point of knee flexion as MRI models. Now, the first one I want to look at is the polycentric joint, which I don't like at all, but uh, this was mounted in relationship to the lateral collateral ligament in terms of orientation as we've described earlier in this presentation. Here's that rotation. So you can start at 0, 30, uh, 60, and 90. Um, it is, of course, subluxing the tibia anteriorly somewhat because a 
true polycentric joint as we've described it as having two geared heads that are, are intermeshed with each other, that's a posterior rolling kinematic joint. It doesn't allow the femur to rotate anteriorly as it occurs in nature. So there is some subluxation of the tibia being pulled forward, which is the reason why I don't like that joint. Um, it's as if you didn't have an ACL at all. Um, polycentric and MTP, very easy mistake to use. Center of the orthotic knee joint at the medial tibial plateau. Look at the gross differential on this one. Here we're starting at 0, 30, 60, and 90. It's not only sub severely subluxing the tibia anteriorly, we actually ha I actually had to cut away the tibial plateau to allow it to articulate. So you can imagine what kind of pistoning this would create in a KEFO, and at that point in time, certainly in a KO, and how that would disrupt sus suspension of that KO on the patient. So I wanted to just show you this visualization, because I haven't given this paper in many, many years. It's unpublished. It was just an oral presentation, but I still have this visualization of what can occur when you misalign an orthotic knee joint, and with the polycentric joint being not a very good design to begin with, when it's misaligned, it becomes horrible on the patient, all right? And then here you can see with silhouette models of the osseous components how it just rotates that femur completely off the tibial plateau in terms of the condyle alignment. It doesn't allow the forward translation of the femur as basically the screw hole mechanism unlocks. So a polycentric joint is uh, purely not your, my first joint at all. I never use them. Um, so in that landmark compilation, when we're setting up, and you'll see when we do the exercise here after we review the orthotic workstation, Lateral collateral ligament is my defining, uh, basically, clinical determinant, but I still use the adductor tubercle, medial tibial plateau, split that difference, measure that height. We all follow the AP6040 rule. The Autobach device is a very nice uh, measurement goniometer. Uh, iliotibial ligament bundle, how it uncovers when you're looking at the lateral collateral ligament. Patella position, I always check to see if it's tracking correctly or not within normal limits. Tibial tuberosity. Uh, as we'll demonstrate uh, in the exercise, typically is a little bit lateral, vertical when everything is with, else is within normal limits. And of course, we've got to take in the foot progression angle as we've been uh, consistent in that message all the way through these couple segments. Okay? So, that'll be the end of this program, and we'll go to uh, the next segment, which will cover the orthotic workstation. All right. So, thank you.